then Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 23 Jesus healed that disease among the people in those days and he heals those diseases in, uh, in our presence and in the church services where we are today and I'm here to tell you that that young man in Arkansas that night the Holy Ghost told me to sing and I'm glad he hadn't told me to sing to you tonight because you would need a healing when you and you got done from listening to me sing because I am not a singer but the Holy Ghost said sing and I obeyed the Holy Ghost I asked the woman to come up she played the piano like a like an old western saloon you remember those old western saloons there's all up on the high keys bang, 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 beating around and I'm singing and in the middle of my singing I heard something. My eyes were closed because I didn't want to look at the people's faces because I, I didn't want to see I didn't want to see how much pain I was putting them in. And that young man was sitting in the in the wheelchair in the middle aisle. There was only two sections, and he was right in the middle aisle. And as I was singing, oh the glory of his presence. We your people give you reverence, so rise to your rest and be blessed by our praise as we glory in your embrace. As your presence now fills this place, somewhere around the second or third round of me singing that, we heard a noise in the sanctuary as the people of God began to stand and worship with me. I'm pretty sure it was because my singing was so bad, but I think it might have been because the Holy Ghost began to move. And in the middle of that, we heard a sound, snap, snap. The seat belts on that young man that kept him in his seat began to come undone. And when we got finished singing that song after about 20 minutes, that young man whose ankles and whose heels of his feet had come up, had bent around and touched the back of his knees, was standing on his own two legs with his two straightened arms stretched out in the presence of God. It is the greatest miracle besides salvation I've ever seen in my 20-some years of ministry. It's the greatest miracle I've ever seen. The young man could hardly breathe. He was dying. The doctor said he would be dead by the time he reaches his 19th or 20th birthday. He was already 16 or 17 by that time. His bones were turned Turning in, but God took care of a Malachion. Jesus healed them then when he walked the seas of Galilee, the seashore of Galilee, and he's taking care of Malachion tonight. This disease that attacks muscles and nerves and bones can be healed in Jesus' name. Come on, right where you are. If you've got something like this that's affecting your muscles, your nerves, your bones, you ought to just reach a hand up to the Lord and say, I receive my help tonight from the Holy Ghost. I receive healing in Jesus' name. I receive healing from arthritis the atmosphere even now is charged with the same power that did it then why because he confirms his word with signs following amen I gotta hurry <laughs> the third thing Jesus healed the next slide would be the next thing that Jesus healed was a disease or sickness called cacos say cacos this is what happened in Matthew 15 22 the Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus and said, My daughter is grievously vexed of a devil. That word grievously vexed is the word kakos. There is something that has attached to my daughter, that has attacked my daughter and made her mentally confused and mentally ill. And do you know what Jesus said? I will come heal her. And Jesus healed that young lady that was mentally confused because of this demonic attack that had grievously vexed her in her mind. Now every, every problem in, in people's minds are not always demons and it doesn't mean you're demon possessed. But here's what I do know. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 says that if the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell on the inside of you, he'll quicken your mortal body. He'll quicken. That word quicken means give life. It's where John G. Lake said there's lightning in the soul of Jesus and that it's very flash. Sickness has to die and sin has to flee. There's something about the quickening power of God that when it strikes you, it changes you forever. There is something about the power of God that not only comes into your soulish realm, that comes into your spirit at the new birth, but it will get into your soulish realm and it will begin to quicken your soulish realm. Why? Because 
He cares as much about your soul and your body as he does your spirit. This young lady, this young lady that was dealing with this cacos in Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 22, Jesus healed that young lady. If you're in this room and you're dealing with mental issues, you're dealing with confusion and you say, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand what's happening in my mind. My mind is not as clear as it used to be. You say, well, it's just age. We age, age can only go so far when you have faith in God. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of excuses. I'm tired of allowing the devil to come in and darken our lives with his power because we've got a bunch of excuses. Well, that's better. That's, I'm preaching better than y'all are shouting on that right there. But I guess if you've used that excuse, that's all right. If you want to live that way, I don't want to live that way. The Bible said Moses was 120 and he climbed a mountain. And the Bible says his natural fourth force was not abated nor had his eye grown dim at 120 years old he had the same vim vigor and vitality as he had when he was 20 and 30 years old why because he was the man of God and so are you and we ought not to give in to it. Well, you know, mama had it and daddy had it, and I guess I'm going to get it. Listen, I got a new daddy. I got a new DNA. I got a new father, and he don't wear contacts, and he don't need glasses. I got a new daddy, and he is the center and circumference of life. He quickens our mortal bodies. He quickens our mortal bodies. He renews, come on, Psalm 120. He renews our youth like the eagles. He renews us. He don't wear us out. He renews us. When Jesus showed up, he did that for people. The next one is the word mastagos. The word mastagos is where we get the word whipping or scourging in the New Testament. It's a sickness that comes upon you and repeatedly strikes you over and over and over again. Have you ever had something that you just couldn't get over? You take the medicine or whatever the doctor prescribes and all of a sudden you move and, you're, and you, you begin to say, well, I think, it's, I think I'm done with that. I think it's over. And then boom, it hits you again. And you go through the whole process all over again. And you come to this point where you say, I think I'm well. I think I'm good. Only to turn it around and boom it hits you again you got something that you can't get rid of in your life it's the word mastagos and Jesus showed up and he healed that mastagos mark chapter 5 and verse number 34 the woman with the issue of blood does anybody know anything about the woman with the issue of blood the woman with the issue of blood had a flow of blood for how many years 12 years 12 years come on ladies One week's too long. For any man in this building, one week's too long. I mean, for any woman in this building, one week is too long. <laughs> we can't go down that road. No, I'm not going there. No. <laughs> She's probably watching. I'm about to get a text. <laughs> Could you imagine that woman, she had a flow of blood from her body every day for 12 years. The Bible says that she went to many physicians. She suffered many things from many physicians, was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Could you imagine this woman starts out, number one, there's nothing said to her, uh, concerning her husband. There's nothing said concerning her children. It is just this woman. She is all by herself. And in the middle of being all by herself, she is plagued with this mastagos. This thing that repeatedly strikes her. She goes to one doctor, and the doctor might seem to have a cure for her. But then in the end, the blood just keeps flowing. She's bled, literally, for 12 years of blood. Literally, for 12 years, the Bible says that she suffered many things of many physicians and was none bettered. Not one doctor helped her one bit. 
So not only is she wasting away in life, but now the scripture says her finances have wasted away. She was nothing bettered but grew worse. When she had spent all she had, the scripture says. There is nothing, there is nothing like having a terminal illness to begin with. The other thing to compound the trouble of having a terrible sickness and disease is to be broke on top of being sick. Any hope that you thought you might have of some doctor that you hear that could help you is all gone because you couldn't pay him now if you wanted to. And Jesus shows up. In the middle of this woman having this terrible, terrible problem, this mastigos, a constant flow of blood for 12 years, she heard of Jesus and she came in the press behind him and she reached out and touched the hem of his garment and the moment she touched him, the Bible said she knew in her body immediately that she was healed of that plague. The word plague is the word mastigos. This thing just kept striking her, just like someone whipping a, a, a slave, uh, have them tied down to a whipping post and they take the whip and they keep striking. That's what's happening to this woman's body in Matthew chapter 5. She is being whipped, stricken over and over and over again. And Jesus showed up and said, it's time for this plague to be done. It's time for for this mastigos to be healed. And the Bible said that Jesus said to that woman, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go and be healed of your plague. Tonight, if you've got a fungus, if you've got an issue, if you've got something on the inside of you that has plagued you, and just when you think it's over and it keeps coming back, your faith can heal you tonight just like that woman with the issue of blood's faith healed her that day in the presence of Jesus. Whoa! Hallelujah! In other words, we ought to walk out of this room healed. The last one that Jesus healed is the word arastus. Help me now. Arastus. Someone so physically ill that they have lost all consciousness. It means that they are so sick that they have gone into a coma. Jesus healed people who were in comas. Literally, I'm not talking about last year, even though I'm sure he did. I'm talking about 2,000 years ago. There were people so sick that they brought them to Jesus, and Jesus brought them out of that coma, instantly healed. How do we know that? We know that because in Mark chapter 16, verse number 18, the Bible says that you shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. And what is amazing to me is that of all the words that Jesus could have used when he said the word sick, he said, you shall lay hands on the arostos. He said, you're going to lay hands on people that are in comas and you're going to bring them out. That's the great commission. The question is, why aren't you doing it? It's the great commission. It's the great commission. Why are we not doing it? That same revival that I was talking about in Rapid City, South Dakota, we had a, one, of the great, one of the great things besides the man, you know, 54 weeks. There's a lot going on in 54 weeks in a revival meeting. The, the man with the AIDS obviously got healed, and there were others that had, that had HIV. They were HIV positive, AIDS positive. That they all got healed. But one of the things, one of the significant things that happened over and over and over again in the revival meeting was we would take prayer cloths and we would send them around the country to people because of this word, because of what I knew in Mark chapter 16. We would take prayer cloths and we would send them to people that were in ICU and they were in the hospitals and they were in comas. And the moment that the prayer cloth with the anointing on it would touch the bodies of the people that were in comas, they would come out of their comas. As a matter of fact, there was a young man that was in a coma in the city, in Rapid City. I couldn't go to the hospital the next day, but some folks said, we're, we're going to the hospital. Would you pray for this cloth? I prayed for the cloth, anointed it with oil, sent it with them. They went in. They went into the young man's room. He's in a coma. They walked in and they laid the, anointing, the, the, the anointed prayer cloth on top of the young man. His name is Robert. When they touched him, they said, Robert, be healed. Robert's eyes popped open. Boop. The next night, he came to the revival and led worship. 
You don't have to clap. I mean, I'm not trying to get you to believe anything. I'm telling you what happened. Whether you believe it or not, that's your deal. He came the next night and led worship. My wife and I, he's a youth pastor down in Texas. We've been down a couple of times and preached for him. And he gets up and tells the story. Part of his testimony is, I was in a coma. I was dying because I had OD'd on drugs. I had gone into a coma in the hospital. I was dying. And they laid a prayer cloth on me that had the anointing on it. And it brought me out of that thing. That's what this word is. And that's what Jesus used in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 16 in the Great Commission. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He said, you're going to lay hands on people that are so sick that they are actually in comas. So if you can get so far down the line that you've got enough power that you can bring people out of comas, you can certainly take care of Mastagos and all the others. Jesus healed these kind of people. Mark chapter 6 and verse 5. This is an amazing scripture to me. Mark chapter 6 and verse 5. Jesus went to his own town of, of Nazareth, and he there marveled at their unbelief. He could there do no mighty works, save he laid hands on a few sick folk and healed them. Y'all with me? Mark chapter 6. He marveled at their unbelief. He could not do mighty works there, so he laid hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And the word sick in Mark chapter 6 and verse 5 is the word arastos. Jesus actually found people that were in comas probably because they were the only ones that could not doubt him Because he marveled at their unbelief the people that were in the meeting he marveled at their unbelief He could not do mighty works for the people that were hearing him because they were resisting him through unbelief So he found some sick folks and he laid hands on them and they were in comas Jesus was an amazing absolutely amazing minister Actually, he was probably the greatest one that's ever lived. <laughs> but we say all that to say this. In Romans chapter 8 and verse number 26, the Bible says, But likewise, the Spirit helps our infirmities. The Spirit helps. Holy Spirit, our helper. Say helper. He helps our infirmities. The word infirmities that is used there as thenios, he is actually saying that in the Spirit... If you do not rely on the Holy Ghost every day of your life, you are an Arostos case. You are a comatose case. I'm not, I'm not connecting with you, I can tell right now. If you don't listen to the Holy Ghost, likewise the Spirit helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. The Holy Spirit makes intercession through us. What Paul is saying, because he uses that word, asthenios, he says, your infirmity, if you don't obey the Holy Ghost, if you're not led and sensitive to the Holy Ghost in your life, you are a rostos. You're walking around in a coma in life. You're not affecting anybody else's life. People are all around you, but you're in your own state. Totally unaffecting anybody else. But if the Holy Ghost had his way, he would have you ministering to people all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you don't obey the Holy Ghost and if you're not sensitive to the Holy Ghost every day of your life, you are experiencing a mastagos. Life is beating you up every day there is a plague on you every day of your life. You're a Christian, you're going to heaven, but you're plagued. And don't talk to me, and I'm sure you don't, you don't have any argument when it comes to Pastor Karen because we've been in ministry too long to know that people can come to church, they can have good church attendance, they can even pray in tongues. That learned tongue that we have and still not fully yield to God, and their lives are a wreck. There's one wave after the next that hits them. It's just like somebody's whipping them, and they are. It is the devil. Why? Because they are not sensitive to the Holy Ghost. They are experiencing the mastagos of the enemy every day of their lives. Every day of their lives. Not only that, but we see this all the time. They are walking around cacos, mentally ill, confused in their mind. Everything that happens to them. They're talking about, why did this happen to me? Oh, my God. I don't know why God do it. They're just confused. Everything that happens to them, they're just walking around going. 
I don't know why that happened. I just can't figure it out. My mind is just so confused. I'm just so, my mind, I just can't. Blah, 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 blah. It's because you're not obeying the Holy Ghost. Because he'll lead you into all truth. Am I connecting with you yet? Do you understand what I'm saying? If you, don't, if you don't trust the help of the Holy Ghost, you're going to be every one of these. This is what Paul is saying. He helps our infirmities. What if you don't let him help your infirmities? Then that means you get to carry them around. Yeah, that's exactly what you will become. Well, are you saying I'm going to get a disease? No, I'm saying in the spirit realm, this is exactly how you're going to act. You're going to act just like you've got a disease. And everybody you get around, you might infect them. Definitely, you act like you got a malachia and you got this disease that has affected your muscles. Because when you don't obey God and you're not walking sensitive to the Holy Ghost, your walk is hindered. Your life is hindered. Your reaching out to others are hindered. Everything in your life, everything in life is crippled. The Holy Ghost is the empowerment of the church to do what Jesus has called us to do. But if we don't trust him, we're hindered. We are crippled. Did you ever notice that when Jesus went to that man that was laid by the, by the pool of Bethesda? The Bible says that the man, the scripture is very clear, the man had a, had a clear mind. I've been laying out here on this bat. I've been laying out here under this porch. I've been trying to get in that water when the angel moved the water. But everybody else gets down in front of me. When you, when you read the story, you realize the man's head is perfectly intact. It is perfectly sound. The problem is the Bible said that he was crippled. He was a paralytic. His head was fine. His body wasn't moving. His body was not responding to the commands of his head. It's a perfect picture of Malachion. It is a perfect picture of the church when the head is sending signals, but we are not sensitive to the messenger, Holy Spirit, and we are paralyzed, we are crippled, and we are not obeying God. There's nothing wrong with the head. He's saying, go do it. Go do it. But we're saying, I can't do it. I can't move. I can't move. I can't move. Why? Because we're not sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Because with every word from God, there's enough power contained in that word to bring that word to pass. And finally, on this part, we are definitely, if we do not trust the Holy Ghost, we are definitely a gnosis. Do you remember what gnosis means? It is a terminal condition for which there is no help. There is no help that is given to the church apart from the Holy Ghost. In other words, if the church of God, if the church of the living God does not learn how to depend upon Holy Spirit, there's no other help for us. You can lean on pastor all you want, but there's only so far a pastor can help you go. You can lean on a ministry team as, as long as you want, but they can only carry you so far. They can be there. They can help you. The small group is wonderful, but until you learn how to walk and until you learn how to hear from God and until you learn how to feed yourself, come on, I'm tired of hearing talk about people leaving the church because, because, you know, I'm not getting fed. It's ridiculous. When my child was four months old, she was trying to feed herself. It was messy, but she was after it. She was going for it. And we got people that are 50 years old complaining about somebody else not spoon feeding them. It's a terminal condition until you learn, until you come to the conclusion, I'm not going to be a baby for the rest of my life. I'm not going to be immature for the rest. Oh, I'm preaching right tonight. I'm not going to be that way for the rest of my life. I'm going to grow up. I'm going to take my pampers off. Mommy, wow, I'm a big kid now. I'm going to take the passy out of my mouth. And I'm not going to come to church saying, I hope pastor has a good word for me today. I hope somebody calls me out. I'm just about, I'm about to throw in the towel. I'm about to quit church and give up on God. I hope somebody has a prophetic word. I appreciate prophetic words. I despise not prophesying. But if, all, if what you need in life is a prophetic word to keep you going, you need to grow up. You need to grow up in the faith. You need to learn the Bible. You need to go home, open the Bible, and read it until you believe it. That's what you need to do. I know that sounds harsh. I know that sounds upsetting to some people but you just have to do it you need to grow up Woo! it's my last night it's my last night it's my last night 
If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're a terminal case. You're a spiritual cripple. You're confused when you pray and when you go to church and when you go to work. You're just confused. You're continually being beat up by problems. I mean, come on. Even a, even a young Christian needs to have victories in his life that he can testify about. But we have people that have been serving the Lord for 50 years and they get beat up by every problem that life throws at them. And we go, what in the world is going on? I'll tell you what in the world's going on. They're not sensitive to the Holy Ghost because he will lead them out of those issues. He will lead them around if they will listen to him. And then you find yourself in a comatose state. You find yourself in a coma where nothing moves you anymore. We get to a place where we come to church and the Holy Ghost can move and you're stiff as a board. You'll go home, you'll even look at nasty stuff on the internet and you're still in a coma. It don't bother you. The holy doesn't move you and the unholy don't move you. You're in a coma. Well, what's the, what's the remedy? The remedy is the help of the Holy Ghost. Ask the Lord to reign on your hard ground until it becomes pliable in the hand of the Master so that He can massage life back into you again so that the thing that's unholy does move you. It moves you toward holiness and the holy things move you toward a greater depth of holiness. That's what is necessary in the life of the person that is in a coma. Let me close with this, the next few slides. When the scripture says here that Holy Spirit is our helper. Say helper. Holy Spirit is our helper. Let's go. That it means this. The word helper in the Greek language is actually not one word. It is actually three words. Only Holy Spirit could do this. It's only used two times in the whole Bible. Only Holy Spirit could do this. When it comes to defining what the help of the Holy Ghost is, he says, one word don't do it. Two words can't do it. You got to take three words and squeeze them all together. So Holy Spirit is our helper. Let's go. The first word is the word soon. Say soon. S-U-N. Well, brother, that looks like sun to me. We're talking Greek. Yeah. The word soon or S-U-N is, it denotes Holy Spirit's Position. What is his position? He's come alongside to partner with you and to cooperate with you. So that's the first thing. When the scripture says the Holy Spirit is our helper, it means he's our partner. He's come to cooperate with us. That's good news. That's where he is. That's his position. His position is he is partnering with us. Look at the next part. Soon anti. Everybody goes, I know what anti means. Anti crowd. Listen, anti is more. Anti is more than just being against something. The word anti in the Greek language, it literally refers more to an attitude than it does a position. So anybody can have the position of being against something. But here, the word anti is referring to the attitude that is against something, which means rage, danger, or dangerous, or violent. So soon... Holy Spirit comes to us and his position is, I'm going to partner with you and I've got an attitude. Next slide. Lombano, say Lombano. Soon anti Lombano. The word Lombano denotes the Holy Spirit's desire and it literally means to forcibly seize something. I've spent quite a few days in New York City ministering and things like that. And even while I was there, I saw a purse snatcher. Has anyone, not on TV, but have you ever in real life seen a purse snatcher? Anybody ever seen one? You've actually seen it. It is a forcible thing. I saw the woman walking down the street, and the man comes up, grabs the purse strap, and shoves the woman onto the ground and runs. The word lambano is what would be used to talk about that purse snatching. The man did not just sashay up to the woman and say, I think I'm going to take your purse now if you don't mind, and then just sashay back on his way. No. He runs upon the woman, and he forcibly takes that thing from her, and he throws her down, and then he runs off in a hurry. That's the word lambano, and that's the 
That's the desire of the Holy Ghost. So let's go to the next slide. So what it means is this. Holy Spirit has come to partner with you. Keep going. He's come to partner with you. And when he comes to partner with you, he has an attitude against that weakness, that mastigos, that arostos in your life. He's come against that malachion. He's come against that infirmity in your life. So when he comes, when he comes to partner with you, he's coming to partner with you because he's got an attitude. When he sees that sickness and that disease and that infirmity in your life, it makes him mad. It makes him mad. So he comes with this attitude against this weakness or this infirmity in your life. Number th the next one. And when he comes, his plan is to help you take hold of that thing and forcibly remove it from your life for good. Listen, if you're in this room, um, Minister Mike talked about homosexuality. Homosexuality falls in, in this category. It, it, falls in, it falls into this thing of cacos. Mentally confusion, mentally ill, being vexed by something. Holy Spirit comes. His desire is this. His desire is this. When I look at you, God made you man or he made you woman. Man is made for woman. Woman is made for man. Not man made for man and not woman made for woman so when he comes into your life he comes with an attitude and he says that thing will not produce in you read romans 1 that thing will not produce in you that which is holy and just in the eyes of god so when holy spirit comes he comes with an attitude not against you against the thing holy spirit loves you enough that he comes at you with an attitude he comes to you with an attitude to take hold together with you against that thing and get it out of your life what i'm saying to you tonight is this on holy ghost night you can leave out of this room totally healed and delivered of anything that has ever bought bothered you in your life that is the real position of holy spirit being our helper tonight in the holy ghost there is enough power there is enough help for you that when you leave this room you never listen this is it he wants to forcibly remove it from your life for good not temporarily, not until next week, not until next month. But when it's gone, honey, it is gone forever. This would be the time I'd call my wife up and talk and have her tell you about her child molestation that she went through from people in her family but the scripture says I will wipe even the memory from you and my wife will tell you that happened 20 years ago and she don't even have the memory of it anymore why when Holy Spirit comes in to help and he forcibly removed that thing from her he did it for good Come on, have you ever been healed? And you know, I don't care if I live another 80 years, I'll never deal with that thing in my life because the Holy Ghost plucked it up by the roots and delivered me fully from that thing. I know, I know. We have a student body at, our, at RSM at our school back home in Alabama. And I, I've seen way too many young men and young women delivered from homosexual thoughts, from bisexual thoughts. In an instant, they are delivered. And now they testify. Some of them, even one of them is the director of our school and addicted to pornography, doing all kinds of things, suicidal thoughts, all of that kind of stuff. But when the Holy Ghost touched him, when the Holy Ghost changed him, it didn't take six weeks. It didn't take a 12-step program. All he had to do was walk down to the altar and he met the omnipresent God and he met the all-powerful God and God wiped that thing out of him and he's never looked back since. And his testimony is, I was addicted to pornography when I went to the altar that night, but it's been 16 or 17 17 years and I've never looked at another pornographic image and I don't want to I don't have a desire to why because the plan of the Holy Ghost is to take hold of that thing and remove it from your life so that you never have to deal with it again never again never again could you imagine freedom freedom is being totally delivered Freedom is not the space of time between you falling into the thing again. Well, you know, I was free for, for three or four days. That's not what I'm talking about. 
Here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, Paul is saying that when the Holy Ghost comes and makes you free, he can make you free in your life for good. It can be over. It can be the final time you ever deal with those things in your life.